Hey everybody, welcome to the Gog Magog War Study. This is part three in a series. This will be released as an audio podcast as well as a video. You can go to the website BibleProphecyTalk.com to find out more about how to subscribe to the podcast or to get the embed for this video. This is part three in which I will be discussing the nations that are involved in this war. So that's the entire scope of part three that is looking at nations like Meshach or Tubal that are discussed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and try to find out where they are geographically on a map. I think my presuppositions going into this actually benefit rather than hinder in this particular study. So what I mean by that is is, as we've seen in the first few episodes here, I lean towards the idea that the Gog Magog War has its greatest and most full fulfillment at the end of the millennium in Revelation 27 through uh, 10. And so because of that, it really doesn't matter to me where these nations are located, because if it happens after the millennium, after a thousand years of peace, I assume the world will be quite different than anyway. There's no real reason I should have any you know, rooting for one geographical area over another. And I think a lot of people do come to these chapters, whether they think it's uh, Russia or Turkey, that they have other parts of their theory that really ride on the geographical areas, like most of what they teach depends on it. So because I don't have that problem, at least in this particular case, I think it allows me and other people that believe like I do to follow the evidence, at least with regard to the location of these nations. All right, so let's refresh. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 6 and verse 13 says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face towards Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor and great hosts, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shields and helmet. Gomer and his hordes, Beth Tagarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples with you. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, have you come to seize spoil? Have you assembled your host to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock goods and to seize spoil? Just clarification here, I'm not going to talk about Gog himself, the person or leader here. I'm going to save that for an entirely separate podcast and study, which I'll do next time. Right now, I'm just focused on these nations and we'll take them one by one. Also, some of you may be looking at this list and saying, hey, where is the word Rosh? I thought Rosh was a nation in this section of scripture. And I would say that I take the view that Rosh is translated as chief, as in chief prince here in the ESV, but I'll talk about that at some length when we get towards the end of this study. One thing to note right off the bat is that all of these nations are included in the table of nations passages in Genesis 10 and 1 Chronicles. So the table of nations are the genealogies of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so you've got Japheth, his sons being Gomer and Magog and Tubal and Meshach and Togarma and Tarshish are all part of the family tree of Japheth. Ham has a few others, Cush, Put, Sheba, and Dedan are in there. So you get the idea that these are literally descendants' names of Noah's three sons. And though there are some disagreements, for example, Magog is very contentious, and I think we'll see right off the bat that it's probably because there's just not a lot of information about that one. Um, but the others are pretty well documented, especially since we have more contemporary sources like Akkadian and Hittite sources. But we'll get into that in a minute when we start charting these out on a map. Before we get started, though, I wanted to take a few minutes and first give just a quick overview, an apologetic argument, if you will, for why the nations that we're going to look at today make the most sense for being listed as a part of a post-millennial Gog Magog war. So let me show you what I mean. I'll just read from Revelation 20, 7 through 10, which says, and when the thousand years are ended, so this is the millennium, after the, th the millennium is over, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, 
The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the idea is that here in Revelation 20, this is a three verse, a compact version of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Ezekiel 38 and 39 told in three verses. I believe all the same elements are there. All the important elements is just shorter. Of the people that don't believe that, I'd say the primary argument has something to do about the nations and the direction. So for example, in Revelation 20 here, it doesn't really mention the nations by name, except for saying Gog and Magog. Other than that, it just says the four corners of the earth, which is pretty uncontested that it means the four different compass points, north, east, south, and west. And they'll say, well, in Revelation 20, they come from four corners of the earth, but in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's primarily from the north, is one way they'll say it, or mostly from the north, or they'll say not from the west. And in this case, they admit that the north is represented certainly, and maybe even the east, and maybe even the south, but not the west. So I've heard that too. But basically, the different variations come to the same thing, which is they can't be the same because the directions of the attack in Ezekiel are different than the four corners of the earth as stated in Revelation 20. But as popular as that argument is, I can't for the life of me figure out where they're coming up with it because by almost every standard out there, it is true that they are from the four corners of the earth. Now, in this particular image, I put the northern cohort, including Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagarma, just somewhere in the north. I didn't try to chart them out. They are the ones that are a little bit contested. The, the other three, though, Push, Kut, and Persia, are basically uncontested. Persia, everybody knows, is Iran in the east. So we've already got the north and east covered. Kush, almost universally understood to be in the south and Ethiopia. So there's the south and then in the west with Put, which is again, almost universally understood to be in Libya, which is basically due west from Jerusalem. So I just can't even fathom how this idea that they can't be the same because of the directions are different. Clearly the four corners of the compass are uh, uh, are represented. Another thing with my apologetics minute here is that these nations exist in the millennium. So you've got Tarshish and Pud and Tubal and Cush and Gog and Magog existing in other millennial passages. So during this thousand year period where Jesus will literally rule the nations on earth with a rod of iron, you know, the, the, the city, the Jerusalem sort of portion, what we'll look at is greater Israel. That's sort of completely controlled by him. But the nations exist and they bring tribute to him during this thousand years. They're, they're, they're not perfect. They're not sin free or anything like that, but they are ruled in a world without Satan. And they are ruled with a perfect government. That is to say, Jesus, uh, at least for a thousand years. And so there are passages like Isaiah 66, which say, and I will set a sign among them and from them, I will send survival to the nations, Tarshish, Put, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javon, to the coastlands far away, that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Or Zephaniah 3.10, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed one, shall bring my offering. Isaiah 11, Psalm 72, Isaiah 60, um, and Revelation 20, Gog, Magog, for example, are in the millennium, and that's indisputable. So it's it's not proof by any means, but it does suggest that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which I'm proposing is a picture of the millennium, it's not surprising at all to see these names there because we know that they exist in the millennium according to other passages in the Bible. But I think one of the best proofs for the post 1000 year Gog Magog war theory, at least as it relates to this study about the nations involved, is who is not involved and why. A lot of people never seem to ask themselves why Syria or Egypt or Jordan or the Palestinians aren't involved in this war. Why is there this huge buffer zone between the players in this chapter in Israel? And I think the best way to understand that is that they have been living, that is Israel has been living in what is known as greater Israel for a thousand years. Greater Israel is a term given to the amount of area that was originally given to Abraham. So God actually gave Abraham this huge section of the Middle East, which was never even close to conquered, even at its greatest point, like with David and Solomon, it was the biggest it ever had been. But still, it was nowhere near to the area that was promised. This is detailed in Genesis 15, 18, Exodus 23, 31, Deuteronomy 1, 7, 11, 24, Joshua 1, 4, etc. But it's also the area that was 
is said to be a part of the millennium. And it's referred to in the prophets as, you know, the, the area is from the Nile to the Euph Euphrates. So it basically covers all of habitable Egypt, most of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, basically everything all the way up to Syria to Turkey, and then you know cutting across uh, most of Syria, Iraq, like half of Iraq. It, it's just basically the entire Middle East is controlled as a part of greater Israel. This is confirmed in Ezekiel 47 through 48 to a certain extent as well. Um, so if you chart that out, which I have here, you'll find out that Put, Tubal, Meshach, Gomer, Tagarma, Persia, Sheba, Dedan, Tarshish, Cush, all of them are basically on the borders of greater Israel. It's no longer a buffer zone. They're actually true border nations to greater Israel. So it makes, to me, a lot more sense um, if we understand this uh, war to be mostly talking about the Revelation 20. All right, enough of me trying to convince you of my theory. Let's start charting these out on a map. And I'm going to start with the Northern Cabal, the Sons of Japheth, that is Tubal, Meshach, Magog, Gomer, and Tagarma. And I'm going to go ahead and show my hand here. This is my chart of where I'm putting these right off the bat. It's all in Eastern Turkey. So that's where I'm going to land on this. Let me show you why I think that. Let's start with Magog, and I think it is the most difficult nation on this list, and the reason is because there is so little corroborating information about Magog. With all the others, there is contemporary, primary-ish sources like the Sumerians or the Akkadians or the Hittites writing about battles with Tubal or Gomer or something like this, but with the case with Magog, there is no source like that. So we're really just left with Josephus and maybe the Targum as a, as a backup source, but there's not a lot of information. And I think I know why, but let's just go through it. First, Josephus says that Magog should be equated with the Scythians. This is what he says in the Antiquities of the Jews. Japheth, the son of Noah, had seven sons. They inhabited so that beginning at the mountains Taurus and Amanus, they proceeded along Asia as far as the river Tanis and along Europe to Cadiz and settling themselves on the lands which they light upon, which none had inhabited before. They called the nations by their own names, for Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatians, Gauls, but they were called Gomerites. Magog founded those who that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. All right, pay attention if you missed that. Josephus calling Magog Scythians is really the heart of everything to do with the Russia theory. Everything else like the Rosh idea and the Moscow and Tobolsk being in any way associated with this is all downhill of Josephus saying that Magog is Scythians. It's crucial that you understand that this is the moment when Josephus called Magog Scythians. Everything else is, we'll see, unimportant. But let's look at what Josephus thinks the Scythians are, because I think this helps to inform what we're talking about. So he says in this quote that Noah's sons, beginning at the mountains Taurus and Amanus, migrated as far to the river Tanis. So if we chart out all that out, which none of those places are really debated at all, the Taurus Mountains are basically northeast Mediterranean Sea, so, so southeast Turkey. And he's saying that that's where they started and they migrated as far as the Tanis River, which is really not that far. It's kind of on the north end of the Black Sea, the modern day River Don. So if we look at that on a map, we can see what Josephus meant when he says they traveled across Asia. And remember, Turkey is basically Asia in the in the ancient world. So they basically traveled east through Turkey, then cut north and a little bit in the Black Sea. So the very tip of southern Russia is where they would have ended up in Josephus's view of the Scythians. The problem with this is that modern historians take a radically different view of the Scythians and their migration. So for example, modern historians believe that the Scythians started in the far east, so near Siberia in Russia. So way, way far away from this. And their migration was westward. They were kind of like the proto horseback riding archers, sort of like a proto Mongols or Huns or whatever. So they, they could cover a lot of area and they were nomadic. And so they moved uh, through the sh their relatively short lifespan, moved westward um, throughout and even got as far as Europe. So definitely a different direction of migration. But even more interesting is that according to most 
views of the Scythian migration, they never really even got to you know, south of the Caucasus Mountains very much. I mean, there was limited invasions. For example, they invaded Palestine a couple of times. They invaded the Persian Empire a few times and different things like that. And there was some very minor settling, but, but they had very little presence south of the Caucasus Mountains in modern day Turkey. And yet Josephus says they start in southern Turkey. So either Josephus is thinking of a different people that he's calling Scythians that start around the, Tor the, the Taurus Mountains in Turkey and then move eastward, or he does know of the Scythians and yet he just says that they are Magogians and he has just a completely wrong view about where they came from or where they were going or anything like that. I do think there is some cooperation in the Targum. So that's the other source I have listed here. The Targum is basically a Bible translation, a Hebrew Bible translation in the first century and on into the rabbinic period. It had like sermon notes and things like that in it. And it translates Magog as basically Germanica. And David Baker in the Anchor Bible Dictionary says that that's possibly Germanica in the Comagene area of the Imperum Romanium, so basically during the Roman Empire. And if we look at that on a map, you can see that where that is, is nestled right between the Taurus Mountains and the Amanus Mountains. So it's, it's the same mountain range that Josephus mentioned in relationship to where Magog started. So there's a pretty significant crossover there. It may even be, have been intentional crossover. That is to say the Targum may have known of Josephus' writings or vice versa or something like that. I'm not quite sure, but there is some crossover there. What I can say with certainty is that this is the only place that we get anything to do with the Scythians and Magog or any any part of this at all. There are some dubious sources. For example, in Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, he quotes extensively a guy named Cumming, who seems to be like an apocalyptic preacher in the 1800s, who did misquote Pliny the Elder in saying that something to do with Magog and the Scythians or whatever, but you can look up the Pliny's quote and it's nothing like that they were saying. But in any case, it really doesn't matter because the city that they're talking about is in Turkey. But my point is that Josephus is the only link to the Scythians and Magog that we have, and it's pretty dubious because it seems as though Josephus thinks the Scythians started out in southern Turkey, which literally no one these days thinks. So concluding with Magog, there is nothing conclusive, I think, on either side. But considering that the next four nations that we're going to look at are much more conclusive, and all of those point to the same area in eastern Turkey, I think it's reasonable to assume for now that Magog was also near the Taurus Mountains in eastern Turkey, where Josephus and the Targum seem to converge. I do want to point out that it may be that Magog is related to the word Gog, that is the leader. So Magog could mean something like the land of Gog or something like that. Therefore, Magog may not even be a place, but a way to refer to those in the land of Gog, such as Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagarma, which might explain why there is so little evidence for Magog and there's so much evidence for all the others in terms of being a place name. But that it itself, I should say, has some problems too, because it does say the land of Magog, so it would be sort of redundant if that was true. So there are issues there too, but I just wanted to mention that before we move on. Moving on to Meshech, and here we have for the first time some early primary sources from the Akkadians and Assyrians. Akkadian sources from as early as Tiglath Pileser I in 1100 BC, they mention Meshech or Mushkaya from the land of Mushku, uh, and this also mentions their capital in East Asia Minor. They included tributes such as bronze, and actually the king of Meshach was Mida, the famous Midas, whose Midas touch turned everything to gold. So that's a pretty interesting connection. Also in Assyria, uh, Sargon II, dated 709 BC, says of Midas, he's the ruler of the land of Mushki and seeks a peace, peaceful relationship with the Assyrians. Map-wise, and some of these maps, of course, you can't really rely on too much, but they do get pretty consistent with Meshach putting it in eastern Turkey here and sometimes on the coast of uh, the, the southern coast of the Black Sea or the northern coast of Turkey. 
and you will also see it pretty consistently near Tiberini, which is Tubal. And of course, Meshach and Tubal are almost always mentioned together in the Bible. When they're mentioned, not just here in Ezekiel 38, but other places in the Bible, they're usually grouped together. So it's no surprise to see them grouped together on the maps as well. Moving on to the historians about Meshach, both Herodotus and Josephus agree that Meshach is in East Asia Minor. They had some, uh, uh, you know, mentioned it as the Moshi and the Tiberini and different things like that that we've been talking about. So pretty much universal agreement with regard to Meshach. I do say pretty much universal agreement because there are still some people that believe that Meshach equals Moscow, which is a view that is really quickly falling out of favor. And the reason is because there literally are no arguments for it other than, hey, they kind of sound alike. And if you think I'm being hyperbolic, go read the original sources like the Schofield Study Bible or Hal Lindsey in which this idea is mentioned. They don't give arguments for it. They just say that it is true, basically. And you know, I guess it does sound enough and they've already convinced you that the Scythians are Russians, so it kind of makes sense. Here's an interesting rebuttal of the idea from Mark Hitchcock, who says, while the names do sound alike, this is not a proper method of identification. Meshach and Tubal are mentioned two other times in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 27, 13, they are mentioned as trading partners with ancient Tyre. In Ezekiel 32, 26, their recent defeat is recorded. It's highly unlikely that ancient Tyre, modern Lebanon, was trading with Moscow and the Siberian city of Tobolsk. The preferred identification is that Meshach and Tubal are the ancient Moshoi and Tiborini in Greek writings, or Tabal and Musku in Assyrian inscriptions. The ancient locations are in modern Turkey. With Tubal, we again have a pretty good amount of primary-ish sources like the Akkadian texts, which mention Tabal and Muski. These are located in East Asia Minor. Herodotus mentions two nations, the Moshoi and the Tiberini, and Josephus writes of Thebal and Meshikans, both of which, again, agree are in Turkey. You can see in this map the Tiberini kind of on the more interior coast, again, sort of northern, northeastern tur Turkey, I would say. Moving on to Gomer, and Gomer is one of those that we just have so much information about. Uh, Gomer was all in the ancient world and all kinds of battles and all in this area in Turkey near the Black Sea. Gomer became Gamir in some languages, so some people called them Gamir, which became the Gamiri, which later in another language became the Kimiri, which became the Kimirians. The first record of Chimerians appears in Assyrian annals in the year 714 BC. These describe how a people termed the Gimiri helped the forces of Sargon II to defeat the kingdom of Aratu. Their original homeland called Gamir or Ushdish seemed to have been located within the buffer state of Mane. The later geographer Ptolemy placed the Chimerian city of Gomara in this region. The Assyrians recorded the migration of the Chimerians as the former people's king Sargon II was killed in the battle uh, against them while driving them from Persia in 705 BC. They're also mentioned as having run-ins in the historical record with King Midas, so Meshach, and then also Tubal. Josephus says of Gomer, I think we read this earlier, that, quote, Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatians, but were then called Gomerites. So Galatia is more central Turkey. The Chimerians was more, I would say, on the eastern side, maybe as far northeast as any of these groups went. So basically due east of the Black Sea, kind of very, very northeast Turkey, or maybe even southern Georgia is where they would have started, but then they would have migrated uh, south more into the Turkish mainland where they would have uh, run-ins with Midas, etc. Next up is another member of this northern J. Pathian cohort, and that is Beth Tagarma. And Beth just means house of, so really we're just looking for the place of Tagarma. And this is mentioned in Neo-Assyrian texts as well as Hittite texts. Uh, in Assyrian, it was Til Garimu. In Hittite, it was Ter Tergarma. In any case, they have a modern city of Gurun, I think is where they put that as a kind of epicenter. But it should be noted that there is a tradition, as you know, with Christian theologians like Jerome, as well as people like Josephus, that put it more west in Turkey. They say that Tagarma is regarded as the father of the Phrygians, which is kind of more west Turkey, but still firmly in Turkey. And of course, I'm sure there was a great deal of migration. By the time Josephus's day, he may have genuinely known these people to be related to Tagarma, but they may have had their uh, start further east or something like that, or vice versa. 
Now that we're done with that northern group, it's going to get a lot easier. And the first example is Persia, which there is, as far as I know, literally no controversy about. It is basically modern day Iran to the east of Israel. So I'm not even going to quote sources on that one. The next one, Kush, also doesn't have a lot of controversy, but I will read a little bit about it. Uh, this again is from the Yale Anchor Bible Dictionary. The north border of Kush during Egypt's early dynasties lay between the first and second cataracts of the Nile, but by the time of the Old Testament had been pushed as far south as the fourth cataract, Kush extended deep into east central Africa, but its southern borders were never sharply delineated. From the Roman period onward, the region was commonly known as Nubia and apparently compromised much of what today are the Sudan and are Sudan and Ethiopia, also known as Ab Absinthia. So you know, there it is, south of Egypt, kind of on the western border of the Red Sea. The next one, Put, is usually equated with modern Libya, although it is a little bit debated as to exactly where in those borders you should put Put. And uh, it's mentioned in the old Persian and Babylonian records and things like that. It, there's just a little bit of question as far as how much you slide it one way or the other. But generally speaking, universally agreed to be in or around Libya. Moving on to Sheba and Dedan, and I put these in orange in my map, and that's because they are not explicitly said to attack or try to attack Israel in this narrative. They're asking questions, are you going to attack? And same thing with the merchants of Tarshish. So I'm not entirely sure they're even a part of this. They may just be bystanders, essentially aghast at the idea of attacking Israel. In terms of their geographical location, Sheba seems to be associated with the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula. This area is known in native sources as Saba, S-A-B-A, -A, and they have had an advanced culture, an advanced culture from the early first century BC and perhaps even earlier. Dedan is also pretty well known, even down to the ruins of it. There's ruins in Saudi Arabia called KHU are a Kurayaba, just to the north of the modern village of Al Ula in the Hijaz. And it gives some coordinates here. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make here is that we pretty much know exactly where Dedan is and pretty much where Sheba is as well. The last one before we get to Rosh anyway, is the merchants of Tarshish. And this is a little bit of a rabbit trail when you start to read through it. And I'm not sure how important it is because it does just mention the merchants of Tarshish. So they're not, it's not the nation itself. Now, Tarshish, a lot of people have uh, assumed it was in Spain. And then there is a whole group of people that think it's actually North Africa and Carthage. And then there's some people that think maybe there's a reason to associate both Carthage and Spain and maybe even some of the Greek Isles. Maybe they are... Phoenician derivative people that were ship ferrying and therefore had lots of ports that they called home. I don't know what the reason for the confusion with Tarshish is. I'm sure I could figure it out, but I just didn't determine that it was particularly important. Number one, because it was just the merchants and number two, um, they weren't even attackers in this, just bystanders. All right, if you've been waiting patiently for me to get to Rosh, I applaud you for waiting this long. And Rosh, I didn't mention it as a nation because I don't think it is a nation. I know in some Bible translations, they translate it that way as if Rosh is just another city like Magog or Meshach or Tubal. But the vast majority of Bible translations do not translate it Rosh, but rather translate it as the word chief mostly. So for example, in the ESV in Ezekiel 38 two, it says, son of man, set your face toward Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. So here the idea is that, that Gog from the land of Magog is the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal. And that's because the word Rosh in Hebrew is translated as chief or first or leader. Literally, I think it means head. And so it's used in the term Rosh Hashanah, which is a celebration to celebrate the first of the year. I think it literally there means the head of the year. So Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year. And so it's translated as chief here, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, whereas the New King James translates it literally as the word Rosh, as if it is a place name. So son of man, set your face against God, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. So are we dealing with a chief prince or just a prince of Rosh 
and Meshach and Tubal. And I think this will be more important when we get to who Gog is later on. I think this has some utility there. But for now, I think it's a little bit over my head in one sense. I've read the arguments in Hebrew and basically came to the conclusion that both are possible. But when you look at the ways that the translators have landed on this, as they say, the vast majority have elected to say that it is chief and not Rosh. And I would also say, looking at this list, and I just basically took this from Bible Hub, which is the one that gives you a bunch of different versions. So I didn't go cherry picking these, these versions or anything. Uh, but it does seem that the newer versions, anything in the last 20 years, has have all elected to translate it chief as opposed to Rosh. Ralph Alexander makes a pretty strong case for the Hebrew, that is to say that the correct translation is chief and not Rosh. I have it on the screen here, but I'm not going to read it. J. Paul Tanner makes a strong case that it Rosh can't be a meeting with Russia, and his main defense, besides the Hebrew, is that there is no biblical place named Rosh. You know, all these other places that we talked about, they're in the Bible, they're in Josephus, they're in, um, you know, ancient history. We've got all kinds of places to go find this, but Rosh isn't anywhere in the ancient world. And then J. Paul Tanner also goes through showing how late in the game the name Russia's etymology came to be and it just doesn't make any sense for it to be there. Now, I, I understand that somebody that believed that this is talking about a future theory with Russia, none of this would matter to them because they would just think, ah, well, the Bible just envisioned the future with Russia, so it doesn't really matter that it wasn't anywhere in the ancient texts. And wh while I tend to agree with that, it just would not be in line with everything that we just read, which all seemed to be based out of the table of nations in Genesis 10, in which all of those were biblically real nations that existed in the Bible and in history. So this would be a big departure from that. And you would expect some something to, to, to mesh with it. And it just doesn't seem to make sense there. All right, that does it for part three. You can go to the website, BibleProphecyTalk.com, where you can sign up for the podcast or the email list or uh, just uh, get this video if you're interested in that as well. Next time, I think we will be dealing with who Gog is or, or what Gog is. We have to figure that out first, I suppose. So check it out then. We'll see you next time.